we are uh, here again. For some of you who attended our last info session in May, we're here again uh, for another Columbia River Treaty info session, this time to hear about the Indigenous-led ecosystem work that is underway to determine how the Columbia River Treaty operations might be changed to benefit ecosystems in uh, the Canadian part of the Columbia Basin. This event is being recorded and will be available to watch, rewatch after the fact or share with your friends. And uh, we encourage you to do just that. So my name is Brooke McMurchie. I work with the BC government Columbia River Treaty team and I'm pleased to be your host for tonight. I am grateful to be joining you tonight from the territory of the Lekwungen speaking peoples known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nations also known as Victoria, British Columbia. I also acknowledge with respect and gratitude the territories of the Tanaha, the Shkwetmik, the Silks Okanagan and the Sinaiaks peoples and neighboring tribes whose territories span the Columbia River Basin. It's great to see so many of you have joined us tonight and I encourage you if you feel comfortable with it to share where you're joining from in the chat, either location or territory. So we're very pleased to welcome tonight's speakers and I'll introduce everyone before each session. Uh, but first I'd like to take a minute to share how the evening is going to run. We, uh, we actually, I'll, I'll start off by extending regrets. We had planned uh, for Councillor Mark Thomas to start us off tonight. Uh, Mark is with the Shushwap Band and he was going to start us off with some opening words, uh, but he sends his regrets. He's been called away on a family matter. So uh, please extend, uh, please, sorry, accept his, his regrets for this evening. Uh, that means that we'll start out with our first presentation uh, as an overview of the ecosystem function work in general to provide context for the other presentations we're gonna hear tonight. After we hear that overview, we'll dive into a presentation on operations uh, to restore floodplain, riparian and wetland ecosystems. And then we'll hear about operations to restore natural river functions. We'll take a quick break before our final presentation on operations to assist in restoring anatomous salmon. There will be time for questions after each presentation and then again before we adjourn at around 8 p.m. Pacific time or 9 p.m. Mountain time. So many of you may be familiar with these types of meetings by now, but for those who aren't, I'll go over it again. Um, if you have a question, please type it into the Q&A box. There should be a little button on your screen somewhere that says Q&A, so you can type your question in there. For the folks, uh, sorry, you can also raise your hand. So there's a function that allows you to raise your hand uh, if you would like to ask your question verbally. Please do not type your questions into the chat or they'll be missed. The Q&A box is the best place to put your questions. For folks who have phoned in, you can raise your hand by pressing star nine during the question period, or at, sorry, and when it's your turn to speak, you'll be prompted to, uh, to speak by pressing star six. I'll repeat these instructions during the question portion of the night too. Uh, we're gonna be alternating between the questions that have been typed in and those who have raised their hands. Please remember to be respectful of those you are asking questions of. And in the interest of time, please try not to raise questions that have already been asked and limit your questions to one to two minutes if you're asking them verbally. Please also keep your questions related to the material being presented here tonight. Uh, for example, if you're curious to know more about Canada-US treaty negotiations or other topics associated with the treaty, I encourage you to watch of the recording of our info session that was held in May, which is available on our website and, and did focus on the CRT negotiations. Uh, it, it was a great session. I know many of you were there as well. We'll share a link to our website during the break. So you'll have a, a direct access to that. So we're gonna try and answer as many questions here tonight as we can. And those we aren't able to answer will include in our summary report after the session. So without further ado, um, I again, Mark Thomas sends his regrets. So he is unable to provide an indigenous welcome to start us off, uh, but I'm very pleased to welcome Bill Green with the Tanaha Nation Council on behalf of the Columbia River Treaty Ecosystem Functions Subcommittee 
uh, and Bill will be providing an overview of DRT ecosystem function studies. Bill, go ahead. He's a kick kick. Uh, my name is Bill Green, as, as Brooks already explained. Uh, I am calling from Kimberly in Amakas Tanaha. I'm very honored to work for the Tanaha Nation Council um, on the Columbia River Treaty Renewal, and particularly on the ecosystem function work. And I'm honored to be presenting to all of you tonight and really appreciate everybody uh, joining us. And so presentation is going to be mostly kind of what, why, how, and then we'll be going into the, uh, each of the other presenters will be providing some details on their specific uh, work areas. So next slide, please. Uh, sorry, Bill. Hang on one second. Okay. It's good. And those of you who have been part of these sessions, you'll know sometimes we come up against technical difficulties. So thank you very much for your patience as we work out sharing Bill's slides. Okay, looks like you're we're good to go. Oh, there we go. Okay. Thanks, Chelsea. So the first I said it's a bit of a who, what, why. And this first one is why. Why are we doing a lot of work around uh, ecosystem function in the process to, re to seek renewal of the Columbia River Treaty? And the first bullet just speaks to the obvious. There's very strong Indigenous nations and public interest. You're demonstrating some of that tonight uh, in kind of bringing together ecosystem as the third leg alongside hydropower and flight control. And so the five governments, the, the three Indigenous nations, the Canada and BC are working to respond to and realize it, this interest and working very hard and working very well and strongly collaboratively together. Next slide, please. So first of all, big thanks to Greg Yutzig, who will be, you'll meet in a little while, who will be uh, doing a presentation on he can tell you about his presentation when he gets there. Um, but this is his diagram to illustrate uh, the concept of ecosystem function. And I think everybody here is pretty familiar with what ecosystems are. Um, and so we'll really turn to the question of uh, what are ecosystem functions. And this diagram illustrates that they're processes. And those processes control flows of energy and nutrients and organic matter and organisms through an environment. And um, you can click to the next slide, please. So this is just further explanation and the Canadian Indigenous Nations and US tribes did a lot of work around the middle of the 2010s uh, around the concept of ecosystem-based function or ecosystem function as it relates to the Columbia River Treaty. And so the first off there is what emerged, or a, a small part of what emerged from that collaborative work between US tribes and Canadian First Nations. Um, agreement around this, this concept and, and we'll highlight the last sentence in the first bullet clean and abundant water that is sufficient to sustain healthy populations of fish, wildlife, and plants. And that's vital to holistic ecosystem-based function and life itself. And I've already kind of spoken about uh, the Western science definition around process. Next slide, please. So uh, a lot of work has gone into this work over the years, and it goes back at least to 2015, the workshops back then. Uh, and probably probably further. And um, so through the kind of period from 2015 to 2019, uh, one of the things that came out of that collaborative work was this uh, set of broad goals, um, which are outlined there. And it's really important, I think, that this is an um, ecosystem function, obviously, is a tremendous value to Indigenous nations culture and their cultural values line up with ecosystem function very closely, but also many, many basin residents and communities. And um, 
but at the, also speak at the end to, first of all, the balance of, between different ecosystem function objectives and then moving to balance uh, between ecosystem function and social economic flood control, hydropower, and other, other values. We can move to the next slide, please. So this illustrates uh, kind of four themes that have, that have driven and, and provided the foundation for the ecosystem function work. Um, so you can see in the diagram that, you know, we looked at three particular broad components of the ecosystems, but we put that then into a broader framework around uh, ecosystem productivity. So we call these the four themes of our, our uh, ecosystem function work. Okay, and uh, next slide. So the question comes up then, so how can we work towards uh, restoring ecosystem damage or achieving ecosystem improvements in a, in a renewed treaty. And so there's kind of two broad strategies to doing that. Uh, and that is the negotiators are actively in exploring and building the concept of domestic Canadian flexibility. So creating space and opportunity within the management of the reservoirs to change operations to, um, to meet ecosystem function objectives. And, and to support that work, um, we're doing, um, developed collaboratively this, uh, what we call the Columbia River Treaty Planning Model. Uh, and we use that model then to build in all of these ecosystem function values, but a broad, all the rest of the values as well. And then to explore scenarios so that we can understand, you know, how much flexibility do we need and how can we use that flexibility to achieve uh, our objectives with respect to improved ecosystem function. Thanks, and the next slide. So the next few slides just give you a little bit more detail on each of those four themes. So um, the first is in the area of ecosystem productivity in the three realms of terrestrial, riverine, and reservoir. And, uh, and then go to the next theme, of course, that Greg and Stewart are gonna be speaking about is floodplain repairing and wetlands. Next slide, please. And the third area is, um, Riverine and Reservoir, the third theme, if you will, the third of the four components of the ecosystem function work is around Riverine and Reservoir ecosystems with four key elements there, functional flows that Ryan will be speaking out about later on, uh, main stem, we're basically talking about Riverine elements here. So main stem, side channel and low gradient tributary habitats tributary access for fish and fish stranding. And then the next slide, please. And then there is going to be a, a, a full presentation on the anadromous species work. So you'll, you'll be hearing from uh, Richard Basanich and Wendell Challenger on that work. Next slide, please. Hopefully we're, and um, so I'll, briefly go through where we're at with each of these uh, theme areas on the and the performance measures, developing performance measures, but I won't touch on the progress on the three that we're gonna be specifically speaking about this evening. So for reservoirs, um, uh, reservoir, this is in the ecosystem productivity area for reservoirs, uh, ecosystem productivity, we have developed a performance measure, the report completed. The performance measure right now is just for air, Arrow Reservoir and we're waiting for additional study information. You can read the rest, but we'll be hearing um, shortly about the, the um, sorry, not the reservoir work, you'll be hearing shortly about the floodplain repairing wetland and ecosystem work. Next slide, please. 
So uh, speaks to main stem side channel and tributary habitats, draft reports completed, and performance measures. And I guess I should tell you a little bit about performance measures, which is we, we have the CRT planning model, which is a model that we can use to explore and evaluate different operational scenarios for the reservoirs. But we have to link the hydrologic outputs like reservoir levels and river flows to uh, things like, well, how much main stem and side channel habitat will that create? And so we do that through performance measures, which, which translate uh, reservoir levels, river flows, and other things into uh, a, a numerical measure of how much will that particular habitat will we get. Next slide, please. I've spoken about this already a bit. This picture is taken from, our, uh, is in the Kinbasket Reservoir, the Columbia Reach. So at the kind of golden end of it, or golden and Donald end of it. And it's uh, very near to the mouth of where the Beaver River flows into. But in, this is obviously at low reservoir level. And so um, we're using what I've talked about already, the CRT PM, the model, to then explore what would be some optimum scenarios that would provide benefits across, would provide improved ecosystem function across a range of ecosystem values. And so this slide speaks to that we started that work. Uh, we have more work to do to get to uh, what we think might be better operational scenarios for ecosystem function that that we can then, the next step after that is then to integrate that with the work around all the other sets of values that are so important in the Columbia River Treaty and explore, okay, where, where's the sweet spot? Where's the place where we, what, what kind of operation will achieve um, a wide range of benefits, including ecosystem, improved ecosystem function. Next slide. So we have, um, We've been working with some success, but not as much as we'd like to build indigenous knowledge into ecosystem function studies. This is a, a really important area of work, but it's an area we need to continue to build. And it's also something you simply, I mean, you can't rush Western science. It takes time to do the studies. You know, we've had whoop studies for 10 years or more and what is planning studies. And it's similar within indigenous knowledge that you can't rush it, it takes time to consider and develop that. We have to complete all the study reports uh, and, and as I've already spoken about, further ecosystem function scenario workshops. And then you can all read that and then the next slide, please. So, um, and this is perhaps the most important point, we really, want your uh, your input and we want your input at whatever level you want to comment on so you know at the beginning i outlined three ecosystem function goals we welcome comments about that because you know we never considered them as fixed and final uh, we viewed them as a work in progress and something that we would welcome uh, public and scientific input into that so uh, an online survey will be emailed to each of you after this webinar. Uh, you can link to it at, there, but that link will be sent to you. And if you want a paper copy, there's an email address. So there's a deadline for that survey. And again, we're using this survey. We're hoping you can provide information that will um, help us do a better job in the future and improve our ecosystem function work. So thank you very much. And I'm done. Thank you very much, Bill. That was great. And uh, we'll also have a link to the survey up at the break and, and again at the end. So you'll have no shortage of opportunities to fill out the survey and figure out where it is. Um, 
Next up, I'd like to welcome Stuart Rood from the University of Lethbridge, and he'll be joined by Greg Yutzik with Kootenai Nature Investigations Limited, and they'll present on uh, the operations for floodplain, riparian, and wetland ecosystems. Take it away, you two. Okay, which is hello from the Blackfoot Territory. Um, I work on both sides, uh, Alberta and BC, and uh, these are shared territories with the Blackfoot and Tunaha. Um, what I'd like to do is follow from Bill's introduction and uh, talk a bit more about floodplain, riparian, and wetland ecosystems and what we're thinking about doing with these. Bill provided a, an excellent background and he finished with a slide that was to some extent pretty desolate and contrasting that barren um, view that he had of Kinbasket during drawdown with this view. This is Arrow Reservoir, south of Revelstoke. It's a rather nice view. We have um, communities of cottonwood forest and riparian shrubs. These are riparian types and riparian zones represent interface zones between land and water. And uh, what they do also is represent the richest wildlife habitats in our region. We're interested in drawdown zones from the four reservoirs and asking the question, can we make other zones more similar to this? Um, I guess I'll give you the punchline right off the bat. Uh, we think the answer is probably. Reminder about the Columbia River Treaty Reservoirs. There were four dams built, three in Canada, one in the United States. Uh, the dams are big and the reservoirs are huge. Um, these were in, uh, installed to uh, create storage capacity. The water is released to generate hydropower not only in the dams themselves, but through a large sequence of dams on the Kootenai and especially the Columbia River, all the way to Tidewater at Portland. The treaty was uh, uh, almost 60 years ago um, and there's a renegotiation or reconsideration to modernize it, thinking about a range of changes. Upstream from the first of those reservoirs, this is a landscape that would be what the landscape uh, would have looked at, like prior to flooding. This is the Columbia Valley near Golden, a uh, rich mosaic of the floodplain zones, the benches, the riparian zones, the flowing water, streamside zones, and the wetland zones. Uh, it's really, really quite something. And in contrast, Bill actually provided this lower view. This is Kinbasket Reservoir. And a number of people think of these reservoirs because they see them in July or August as looking like the top photo, as somewhat like a lake. However, for much of the year during drawdown, we might describe them technically as not a lake. Another example, more of the same, this is the Duncan Reservoir. The Duncan is a tributary that's the north arm into uh, Kootenai Lake. It also has a, um, a treaty dam, which doesn't currently have hydro uh, power facility at it. And the same story we see here, it looks like a lake when it's full, but during drawdown, it's pretty bleak. This annual pattern of inundation and exposure is lethal to all vegetation. And as a result, we, what we've lost is that habitat, that community, that ecosystem, which we desire. So relative to the modernization, the third leg of the stool is being added or at least proposed is the ecosystem function. I think there's support on both sides of the border for this. Um, relative to the river systems, we might imagine that this would involve a more natural regime. Reservoirs are a little bit uncertain because they're really not quite lakes. They're, they're uh, storage reservoirs. They have a natural or an artificial pattern. And so we asked the question, um, what can we do with these? And that's the question that we've addressed. We started off with asking the question, what plants are where and why? And the why relates to their physiology and especially their inundation tolerance. Uh, but we also think about the inverse of this question, and that is, um, where are the areas where there aren't plants and why are those uh, areas barren? Um, we're particularly interested in these three categories of communities, and we have a cluster of photographs in the upper right of those, including cottonwood forest, the top row, riparian shrub, especially willows, and riparian herb with sedges and reed canary grass and horsetails and others. Uh, these three communities um, are sort of stratified. They go from higher to lower. And so the cottonwood forest is a very, very narrow thin band right below the full pool. Below that extending further down with more 
inundation tolerance of the shrubs, and then much more tolerant are the herbs. We take a look at the four reservoirs, and uh, we've also coordinated uh, data from a decade of studies, as Bill indicated, with the WAP process. And what we find is that if we think about those three community types, the dark green is the cottonwood forest, the lighter green is the uh, riparian shrub, which is mostly willows, and then the yellow or orange is the herbaceous. And in this bar graph, what we represent is how far down they extend into the drawdown zone. So you can see that first of all, the patterns are pretty similar across the four reservoirs. And that's helpful because it'll suggest that we can have a common model to um, address the four reservoirs, although there will be some refinement across those. From these elevational distributions, we then take a look at the historic hydrology, the, the reservoir regime and ask the question, at those elevations, how many days were inundated? This provides this cluster. And again, we see pretty common patterns across the four reservoirs, which is very encouraging. Again, we have the um, darker green is the cottonwood forest. We have the uh, lighter green, and then we have the um, herbaceous uh, zone. And you can see that the number of days that they can tolerate is much, much higher, corresponding with the lower distribution. This is an interesting cluster of studies. And in fact, we had eight different approaches. Um, there was very high degree of convergence. And I think the precision here is about a half meter, which is uh, considerably better than we expected when we started this study years ago. What we're doing is relatively novel. Not a lot of people have been doing this and that um, more commonly people think that the solution is planting. Um, we believe that by management of water surface, we can perhaps have much broader responses. Following from those data, we then end up generating these performance measure values as Bill referred to. What these represent is the numbers that get put into the models to allow us to project the outcomes from different scenarios. So if we change the pattern of reservoir regulation, what might be the response? To answer that question, the model includes this cluster of numbers and in the blue with the arrow, the key numbers, some of the key numbers, represent the number of days of inundation. So the cottonwood forest can tolerate on average about 25 days of inundation. The riparian shrub about double that. And then the herbaceous plants about double that. There are some other numbers in here as well for recruitment. You have to establish new plants occasionally. And you also have to make sure that there's enough interval of exposure for these plants to grow and become resilient. These then are the numbers that are applied in the model, which Greg will describe. Hi, I'm Greg Yudzik from Nelson, BC, a consultant working with the Three First Nations and also with the Upper Columbia Basin Environmental Collaborative. Um, in, in addition to the, uh, the inundation tolerances, we also have to think about the substrate that this potential vegetation will be growing in. And ideally, we'd have a, a detailed soil map of the bottoms of the reservoirs, but that doesn't exist. But we found that we can maybe use some other factors to uh, predict where they're most likely to occur. One is slope. If you've ever spent any time in these reservoirs, you know the steeper slopes tend to be eroded, not very suitable for planting where, or for plants to establish. Whereas the shallower slopes, the more flat areas tend to have the finer textures and more likely. Also, uh, moisture is going to be important. I'll talk about that a bit more in a minute. But we've looked at areas along streams that run into the reservoirs and also areas where seepage occurs. And in the case of the seepage, we're looking at seepage that was identified <clears throat> from the mapping prior to the reservoirs being established. And lastly, you need a seed source. So we're looking at the distance from the shoreline where in most cases there are seed sources next. And in addition to that, we're also gonna look at wetland habitats um, and those require basically flat slopes in places that we think are potential for establishment of wetlands are areas where there were wetlands before the, the area was flooded as well. And we put all this together in a series of maps using uh, GIS systems. And 
create an overlay and each of those little polygons in there will have a, a specific value in terms of its likelihood of establishing vegetation. And we'll use that to evaluate each of these different elevational bands in terms of their likelihood of providing vegetation if we can change to meet the uh, flooding requirements that Stuart talked about. Next. So the way this actually comes together as uh, both Bill and, and Stuart have talked about is we have this planning model and we would introduce a scenario, a particular series of pieces of information that determine how much uh, flooding there is, how long it lasts, what season that does it occur in. And, th and then we look at that in terms of each of the elevation bands. We were looking at one or two meter elevation bands in each of the reservoirs next. And we bring together the information that Stuart and I have talked about in terms of establishment sequence, maximum tolerances, exposures, and next. And those things come together to say which elevation bands are capable of which supporting which communities under this particular scenario. Next. And to that, we apply the uh, site factors that I just talked about in the previous slide in terms of the likelihood of establishment and next. And the output of that is we actually come up with an hectares of area with the capability of supporting each of the different vegetation types for a given scenario in each of the reservoirs. Okay, next. Um, there's other factors that we need to keep in mind as well. And climate change is certainly one will be, certainly climate change is going to have an impact on the hydrology of the, the uh, reservoirs and the streams, but it also has an effect on the growing potential. Um, just as an example, this is some mapping we did in terms of the frost-free period or growing season within the uh, southern end of the uh, Kimbasket Reservoir. You can see there's quite a variation even within that reservoir. Next, we've mapped that for all the different reservoirs. And in the case of Arrow, there's kind of a northern and southern section. And in Kimbasket, there's sort of three sections, the uh, northern canoe, which tends to be more boreal, middle Kimbasket, and then the southern bush was a bit drier. Next. But as I stated, climate change is going to have an impact on this is just as an example, this is looking at the canoe reach and the Duncan reservoir. This is a number of frost free days over the last few decades, and the way that's projected to change into the future, with the solid circles indicating uh, we don't do anything about uh, our carbon emissions and the lower one says that we do do something. So it's a bit of uncertainty in the future, but clearly the trend is that growing degree days are going to increase, which is maybe an advantage. Next. But simultaneously, there's another change, and that's in the uh, a drought index. In this case, we're, it's a climatic moisture index that looks at the amount of effective moisture available for plant growth. And you can see that's decreasing in both of these reservoirs. So even though the uh, frost-free period is increasing, the season is great, we're going to have more drought which has implications that those seepage areas are probably going to be much more important in terms of uh, revegetation. Next. So just to kind of sum up what we're talking about, this is sort of the present distribution of these different uh, vegetation types within the reservoir. Next. And what we're hoping to do by changing the way in which we manage the reservoirs, the amount of flooding, the duration of flooding, um, that we actually can extend these further down into the reservoir and create this riparian zone around the edges of the reservoirs through changes in the regulation. Next. So in terms of the program, um, just some of our challenges. There's, as I stated before, we don't have any soil mapping for the reservoirs. Um, we've had to do quite a bit of work to try and upgrade that information. Getting elevation bands, established for the reservoirs has been uh, complicated because there was no good mapping before the reservoirs were flooded. Kukun is a reservoir, there was almost no information, although we just had some flights done this spring, and it looks like we're going to be developing some information for working in the Kukunusa, but we're just starting on that. And the long-term challenge, of course, is, is this active adaptive management that Bill has, has mentioned. Monitoring, trying things, and then monitoring to actually try and verify our model that we've created to see if we actually get the reactions that we're projecting. And lastly, of course, there's gonna to have to be this balance between hydropower and flood control and ecological function. So it's trying to figure out how we can work out 
that kind of sweet spot that Bill mentioned where we improve ecological function but still maintain some of our values in terms of hydropower and flood control. And there's also some balancing between the reservoirs in the end. It's uh, in some ways like a waterbed, you push in one and push down on one part and the other part comes up. So gains in one reservoir might mean losses in another. And just lastly to say, this has been a team effort. Uh, Stuart and I are presenting here today, but this is a list of the other people who've been involved in this project as well. Thanks. Thanks very much to both of you. And maybe, so we are going to take some time to answer questions here. And I see that there's one that's been entered into the q and I'll repeat now how to ask your questions um, and maybe go back on my comment earlier. Don't be too worried about whether or not uh, your question is uh, specifically applicable to what you're hearing. If a question comes to mind after hearing uh, Bill, Stewart, and Greg's presentations, please type it into the chat or raise your hand. Um, and again, for those of you who have phoned in, you can press star nine to raise your hand. Uh, I also meant to mention at the beginning of this evening that the um, presentations and a summary of each of the studies that you're hearing about tonight are all available on our website. Um, they were posted today for the intent that you can go through them after the, the session. There's a lot of dense information here. And so there's uh, lots of resources after the fact that you can go through. So uh, all of that being said, uh, we welcome any questions that you have on the information that's been provided so far. Uh, and maybe I'll read out the question that's in the Q&A box right now, and then Stuart or Greg, you can choose who'd like to respond. Um, and I'm going to mispronounce a word, I already know. Does wetting and drying lead to mercury methylation? And is that a problem in Canada? Um, I can take a stab at it. Um, it definitely is a problem. It's generally associated with uh, reservoirs that have flooded and never been cleared. So there's a uh, breakdown of organic matter leads to this. It was a very serious problem for a number of years in the Peace River reservoirs because they weren't cleared. Um, in the case of the Kootenai reservoirs, much of them were cleared or subsequently cleared in the case of Duncan's with some underwater logging. Um, it's, and it's generally a short-lived, well, short-lived in terms of a decade or two. And since these reservoirs in general are 60 years old, the problem may have been there in the initial stages, but it doesn't appear to be a problem at present. Thanks very much, Greg. Any other questions from folks at any level? Sometimes that's a sign that the presentation was super clear. <laughs> I, I could uh, just elaborate just a little bit on that, um, Brooke. Sure. Uh, so Greg's got it uh, bang on. And, and to some extent, the mercury, the source of the mercury is in vegetation that's uh, submerged and uh, decomposed. And um, the methylation is a process that's anaerobic. So at the bottom, the deep parts of the reservoir, there's that conversion to a form that becomes bioaccumulated. Um, and so yes, indeed, um, uh, mercury methyl methylation is a problem in Canada. Uh, as Greg indicated, it's typically a bigger problem at the beginning, and especially it's a problem for reservoirs that aren't cleared, they're not logged, uh, which is interesting. You think about it, it's kind of a double whammy in the sense that you sacrifice all that timber, and then unfortunately you end up with a toxic hazard. Uh, so it's an excellent question. It's a very important factor, uh, but to some extent, fortunately, it's not as severe for these reservoirs as some. Thanks very much, Stuart. So we do have another question. What about water temperature and is it changed by skimming over the dams? And Bill, sorry, I see you've got your hand raised. You go ahead. Yeah, uh, take a kick at that. And so if we talk about the Columbia River Treaty Dams in particular, so Duncan, Keenly Side for Arrow Reservoir and Micah for the King Basket Reservoir, uh, they all have few of them operate by skimming water over the over the dam so that's called surface spill and uh, it happens very infrequently and is to be avoided and instead uh, the discharge so for mica dam is from very low in the reservoir and so if there is a temperature change as a result it's likely to be 
cool, cooler than uh, it is changed indeed than the average temperature through the reservoir or lower than typically. And then uh, for the aero reservoir, uh, skimming has kind of already happened there because there's a, a sill at uh, Syringa, which is upstream of the dam. So there is mixing from upstream water and uh, when it passes over that sill, and then of course, um, there's infrequently, there's two spillways, two spill methods at, uh, or discharge methods at the Keenly side dam. Um, and they take water from fairly low, but it's already been subject to the skimming mechanism. And then uh, for Duncan tends to be uh, uh, low level discharge as well. So, um, in some instances, there is uh, a temperature effect of the dams very clearly. Um, typically, it's, uh, it can be cooling. We certainly observe that at Revelstoke, um, downstream of Mica Dam, where um, uh, uh, temperatures have been reduced uh, downstream in the summertime compared to what they were historically. Thanks. Thanks, Stuart, go ahead. Uh, that's a great question, and um, uh, certainly for aquatic systems and, and especially fish, temperature is really an important factor, not only for growth and development, but also as a cue. Um, so the, the, the fourth uh, dam is Libby, and uh, Libby, in fact, was one of the first dams worldwide to have something called selective withdrawal. And so what this is, is a slotted gate structure on the upstream side. This thing can be raised or lower to select the water temperature that's appropriate. Um, for the particular life stages of the fish downstream. And so that was a pretty novel application um, and, and to some extent pioneering. And, and uh, I will say that uh, the US Army Corps are doing some pretty interesting stuff um, with um, Libby. And of course, keep in mind that, that this not only affects Kupanusa, but the Kootenai River below Libby Dam goes back into Canada uh, at Creston. And so uh, we, of course, are directly impacted by operation of Libby, just as the folks in Montana and Idaho are. Thanks for that, Stuart. Uh, so there's there's one comment in, in the Q&As providing some additional data on Lake Kukunusa. So that's a heads up for the researchers. Uh, and another question here, are you looking at ex excavations with water controls like Bummer's Flats and other areas in Upper Columbia River Valley in the modeling? Anybody want to take a stab at that? Sure, I can. I can take a, a quick stab at that question. Thank you. And uh, we're not looking at at something with that detail. Of course, Bummer's Flats and the excavations and water control that are happening that have been constructed there are Upper Kootenai River, but we're not building a model that has that amount of. Uh, detailed, uh, it's just a level of detail that our model doesn't uh, doesn't work at. And the model is really focused on the reservoir levels and on, on the river flows. And we're, um, yeah, hopefully in the future we can get to a more detailed level, but we're really focused on answering questions pertaining to what if we change this in the dam in the operation of the dam or in the reservoir level or in discharges, how will that affect things like the floodplain riparian and wetland ecosystems and how will it affect other ecosystem values? So interesting question and thanks for it. I think we've got time for a couple more questions here. Uh, so one is asking, we got the answer for how the temperature is affected downstream of the release. What about the remaining water? Uh, I can respond quickly. Um, yes, yes, indeed. And um, so Greg and I are particularly focusing on uh, the FRW, the floodplain riparian and wetland. Um, I'm not sure, I think Ryan um, will speak mostly about riverine, but yes, indeed, um, uh, Ben Munier and others are quite interested in um, the fisheries within the reservoirs, which is influenced by um, water temperature that is in turn influenced by regulation. So yes, indeed, it's part of the um, consideration and also part of the modeling 
Um, some of you will know that temperature modeling is maybe less well developed than some other things, but we know it's important and yes, it's being addressed. Thanks very much. So we've got another question. Uh, has anyone addressed any potential impact on migration and predatory patterns of elk, caribou, wolf, et cetera, for either flooded or empty reservoirs? Um, I, I would say that there was a, a dam impacts series of studies that was done about 10 years ago, which looked at the impacts of the construction of the dams uh, on environmental values and migration was one of the considerations, but given that at this point in time, we're not actually talking about doing away with the, <laughs> the reservoirs, um, it's unlikely we're gonna have a significant impact. Um, it's, I guess that so far the work that's been done looking at animal use within the reservoirs, whether they're drawn down or not drawn down, there's very little use by large mammals, mainly because there's no habitat. And I think that that's one of the potential secondary benefits of yeah. the work that Stuart and I are doing is trying to look at how we can create some habitat within the reservoirs so that when there is drawdown, there is actually some usable habitat that may allow for those, those kinds of uses and migration across the reservoir at that particular time of the year. But uh, we're not specifically looking at that. That's a very long-term goal. It is one of the considerations, but it's not something we're looking at at the moment. Thanks, Craig. Uh, Brooke, Bill, do we you still, something? Go ahead. Do we still have time for more questions? We do. Let's take uh, one more question and then we'll move on to the next portion of our evening. Go ahead, Bill. Okay, well, I'll just note to everybody that uh, no, there's a lot of questions now, which is great. And they will be answered either immediately, if, if they're not answered orally during the presentation or after the presentation, they will be work doing our best to try and answer them either now or during the session or subsequently. So thanks for the questions. I'm gonna to turn to Chad Hughes question. Is there a need for rehabilitation, restoration on dam margins or is water level management anticipated to drive vegetation growth entirely organically. And I think uh, over to Stuart or Greg, and I think it's a really key question. Thanks. I could uh, start and Greg might follow. Chad, that's a great question. And um, um, part of the, the interesting element of, of the submodeling that Greg described is that we are indeed quite interested in the capacity of the drawdown zone. Um, it is the case that there may be some interventions, but generally speaking, we're going to start off and hope that if the reservoir regime is favorable, the vegetation will in fact naturally colonize. And um, to, as I mentioned, to some extent, this is a systemic restoration approach. So instead of planting a few trees or shrubs here and here and here, we're talking of hundreds of kilometers of shoreline. Now, not all of them are, are gonna be favorable. And as Chad or Greg indicated, steep slopes especially are really, really difficult. But I think Chad, we're gonna to try to focus on um, encouraging native colonization as a strategy and, and the tool for that will be reservoir uh, regime regulation. I, I might just add a little bit to that to say that we have evidence to show that the natural stuff will come in. Um, for example, in Kim Basket, there was a series of four or five years um, prior to 2020 where the reservoir didn't fill. And in fact, there was significant revegetation in some parts of the reservoir, particularly the upper ends. Um, however, in 2020, or the, uh, the reservoir was brought up to full pool and held there for a long period of time and killed off that vegetation, which indicates that we do have to change the regulation. Um, and the additional evidence comes from the fact that there were extensive planting programs done throughout the Arrow and Kimbasket reservoirs over the past 10 years, and virtually all of them have failed because they didn't change the regulation. It might work for a year or two, but as soon as you fill the reservoir and hold it that way for a long time, basically the mortality is almost 100%. So I, I think that uh, once we get a good handle on the regulations such that we have uh, a flooding regime 
that allows vegetation to occur, we may in fact then begin to look at rehabilitation and restoration to speed up that uh, revegetation once we know that we've got a zone where it's worthwhile to expend the effort in terms of planting. There's other potential issues as well. And uh, one of those is uh, ATV and four wheel drive use in the reservoir, yeah. which has also been a problem with some of the previous plantations. That's great. Thank you so much uh, to all three of you for your answers. We are going to move on to the next presentation now, and I'll reiterate what Bill said. There's lots of questions in the Q&As. Um, some, some may get responded to in writing by some of the panelists, uh, but any questions that are not responded to will include in our summary report. They'll get responded to afterwards. So thank you again, Stuart and Greg, for your presentation uh, and Bill for responding to the questions. And now I am pleased to welcome Ryan McDonald of Mac Hydro Limited, and he is going to talk about operations for restoring natural river functions. So Ryan, welcome, um, and the rest of us will turn our cameras and microphones off. You have the floor. Thanks, Brooke. Uh, can you guys see my screen? Yes, we can. Right on. Yeah, thank you. So yeah, I'll be talking today about functional flows and um, essentially the idea around uh, looking at how to promote flow regimes that are more natural in the system. Um, just looking at the, the overarching goals and objectives of the study, um, and you'll see here they're fairly lofty and I'm, I'm not going to read them verbatim, but ultimately the, the idea here is to restore um, flow regimes that are important for, for key species and important for river functions. And the objectives here are ultimately to manage reservoir levels that allow us to do that um, and, and promote these habitats that are lacking in the system currently. Um, and one way to look at that is to look at you know, what may have existed there pre-dam. Uh, so we have some information about that and I'll talk about that tonight. Um, but really the idea is to, to promote different parts of the hydrograph. And one thing I'd like to acknowledge is that these goals are pretty lofty and that the work that we're doing here as part of this um, modernization of the Columbia River Treaty really is, you know, in respect of in Indigenous perspectives and looking at this from a, a, you know, a lens that requires long term thinking. These types of changes are really for our children and our grandchildren. Um, they're not necessarily going to be implemented in real time right tomorrow, but these types of changes are long term and hopefully long lasting. So looking at, you you saw a slide like this already in, in Bill's presentation, but these gravel bed rivers, um, and Stu showed an a, a image of the, the Columbia River upstream of all the reservoirs, that these gravel bed rivers really are fundamental to ecosystems in these landscapes. They cycle nutrients, as Bill mentioned, they, they move material throughout them, they move water, um, and they're, they're foundational to making sure that um, life on earth is actually functional. So promoting the, the function of these rivers is really what we're after. When we talk about river function, really the, the flow regime or the way in which rivers behave is fundamental to how the different components of, of a system behave. So when we talk about flow regime, so this is, you know, if you can envision a river flowing down um, a valley, uh, we're thinking about the magnitude, so how much water is there, how often water, you know, how often things like flooding occur and, and droughts occur, the duration of those types of events, um, the time, so when do they show up, when do high flows show up, and the rate of change in the system. And what ultimately this flow regime does is it dictates, you know, the quality of the water. So we've already talked about water temperature, there's also chemical water quality. It dictates the energy sources, so how uh, energy is moving through the system. It dictates the physical habitat. So, you know, what's there for in terms of wood and, and, and rocks for fish to live in. And then those biotic interactions. So um, the organisms that are well um, adapted to living in these systems ultimately are adapted to the flow regime. And what this ultimately leads to is ecological integrity. So we can see already that the flow regime of a system is fundamental to um, ecological integrity. Uh, with that context, so we have to acknowledge that, that regulated river systems are not natural, um, nor will they likely ever be. So we're not necessarily talking about taking out uh, dams in this study. We are talking about uh, looking at components of the flow uh, system that would help promote uh, natural functions. This is a bit of a busy slide, but I'm going to walk through it hopefully fairly slowly. Um, so we're talking about here about this concept of functional flows. And uh, Sarah Yardell and colleagues in California, this graph is from California, and what it's showing is discharge, so that's flow in a river. And these lines are showing um, 
the, the, the amount of flow in the river. And this is a river in California, so it looks different than the way our rivers behave. But what she's showing here is essentially, we have a wet season, we have a high flow period, we have a spring flow period, and we have a dry season, low flow period. And again, different from our system, but what she's identified is that this dashed line is, is showing different parts of the system that actually do something in terms of ecological, ecological function. So what we can do in, the, in this work is quantify these different flow characteristics that are important for different ecosystem functions. And we can start to use these to um, understand how we might wanna manage a system differently to promote ecosystem function. That's what I'm gonna talk about here in a sec. So this slide is from Stu Rood. Uh, so thanks Stu for this one. Uh, he's already, we've already talked a little bit about Libby and a little bit about um, the Kootenai River. And one of the nice things about this is it's a real world example of that functional flows are implementable. So here's the Kootenai River in 1972, and here's 1994. Um, this is showing one of the, the key species for this work that we're working on right now, the white sturgeon. These plots are showing again that value discharge, which is, which is flow in the river. The blue line here is pre dam So this is 1943 to 1972. The red line is 1975 to 1994. So you can see that there's quite a difference between these two lines. There's no longer any sort of high flow. The low flows are much higher. Um, so what, what um, they did was essentially say, okay, well, white sturgeon are actually a listed species. So let's try and help them out. Uh, and um, our US counterparts actually impl implemented operations that allow um, some pieces of the hydro hydrograph to be restored. So they have this thing called sturgeon flows and then ecological flows. And what they're doing is essentially trying to give um, sturgeon key components of the hydrograph that they need. What this ultimately did was help them out. Um, functional flows are successful. So as a byproduct of that, we can look at things like, again, this is a slide from uh, Stu, some of Stu Rood's work on uh, riparian cottonwoods. Um, is the, the flows can be um, implemented in a way that uh, is sort of done in an opportunistic way. So here's just a plot um, on the right showing um, the red line or red bar, sorry, are poor recruitment for cottonwoods. So the cottonwoods didn't uh, reestablish and grow. And the, uh, the dark green line is excellent. So they did reestablish and grow. In the high flow years, we can see that um, there, there became more of these green sort of bars showing up. So after the implementation of the sturgeon flows and the ecological flows, we also saw um, cottonwood recruitment improve. So we know that if we implement flow regimes that, are, that help promote ecological function, we can actually see an ecosystem response. Um, so that's really important for this study that we're working on. Speaking about uh, parts of the Columbia that we're working on, uh, here's just a map. I'm not gonna go, go through this in any detail, but we've got a number of river reaches that we've identified. So these are just sections of the river that we're looking at. And all of these are in the modeling that um, others have already talked about. So these are parts of models that we're able to um, look at these different points and start to see, you know, what might our responses be in terms of the, the ecological function. So why, you know, what does the Columbia River look like right now relative to a natural system? And so why are we doing this work? We can see that uh, as an example, downstream of Mica, so the red um, lines and, and then the shading around them are the sort of the current operations of the current way the system is, is uh, behaving. And then the blue line is what it would have behaved under a more natural uh, flow regime. So these are data sets actually from um, uh, BPA and we've used these data sets in, the, in our modeling. So what they're actually showing is that we've got a you know much higher and, and more variable low flows and we've got a much lower and less variable high flows. Um, what this ends up doing is resulting in, in a flow regime that doesn't promote things like sediment movement in the system. Um, it doesn't really promote uh, the types of ecological functions that we're looking to, to restore here. Um, but we can use this functional flow regime or functional flow concept to help restore um, on these systems. And we can sort of see, you know, downstream of Libby, we've got, got a different shape. Um, and, uh, you know, downstream of Brilliant, we see a bit of a different shape. And ultimately, we can use these information to try and help us help guide us. Our model or our conceptual model for how we're going about this, again, I've already talked about uh, riparian cottonwoods. So what riparian cottonwoods ultimately need um, is high flows. They need flows to recede at a pretty gradual rate. And then they, they need sort of a, a low flow stability and, and sufficient summer flows to be able to survive. 
So we're looking at these types of the components of the hydrograph of the hydrologic system to help uh, help guide us in this work. For the white sturgeon, um, again, that, that Libby example is a really good one. Um, what we're looking at doing for as a performance measure for the other reservoirs is you know, looking at a spawning period, looking at scouring flows that, that might be needed to promote sediment movement in the system, and then looking at that again, that gradual descending limb of the hydrograph to help them help the young ones, I guess, survive. So these sort of concepts of, of trying to mimic portions of the natural hydrograph are being used in our study to help guide what the, the reservoir operations might be. Um, some of the limitations of this work are, you know, um, we've already seen in the chat today that there are different data sets available. We're, we're still limited by the data that we have. So this is really a, a conceptual model and that, that's what we're working with right now. Um, they're pretty theoretical. Uh, we would like to implement more site specific work uh, to help refine this work. And it doesn't necessarily, and Bill already mentioned this as well, uh, adequately address um, traditional ecological knowledge. And that's a piece of work that we're working on right now. So yeah, with that, um, that's sort of the functional flow concept. And thank you. I think I was on time. Yeah, you did great. Thanks very much, Ryan. Um, there's a lot more questions or, or a number of questions in the chat, or sorry, in the Q and A's. Uh, what I did want to remind folks of is I see some questions in the chat. Uh, please make sure you put your questions or the comments you'd like addressed uh, in the Q and A box. Uh, the chat is too difficult to monitor and sift through the questions. So a reminder to folks who are typing into the chat. Um, so we do we do have some questions and I am gonna pass it over to Bill to select some questions for Ryan on this one. Uh, so Bill, it, Ryan, you'll still be answering questions, but Bill, uh, are, there, are there any you want to raise at this point in time? Yeah, I think the first one that's come up in response to Ryan's presentation is, uh, I'll read that one out. Will it be possible to secure additional spawning habitat in the Revelstoke Reach, even as Revelstoke Dam re-regulates the flows from MICA for additional power generation? Perhaps a similar type of flow management used for the Hanford Reach of the Columbia River further south? Um, so, Ryan, can you take us out of that one? <laughs> I can't, that's a tricky one. Um, so I guess at a, at a high level, um, conceptually, you could probably restore more spawning habitat. Um, you know, Revelstoke is used in a bit of a different way relative to the treaty reservoirs. So we're not necessarily looking at it in the same way, but the Revelstoke reach is, is a reach that's been identified as, as key importance for here. And it's a fairly well studied reach. So it is one of the places where we have good data. We can probably test some of these things. Um, so I guess conceptually, yes, you probably can restore some of the habitat there, um, but we're not specifically looking at that um, in much de detail right now. And go ahead, Greg, I guess you have maybe a better response. Just one response comment to add on that. The biggest, when we did the mid-arrow study, looked at changing the way the arrow reservoir is, is managed, that has a big bearing on the Revelstoke Reach because if you need to lower the, Re the arrow reservoir to expose some of the Revelstoke Reach, um, so if you don't change the Revelstoke Reservoir, there is no Revelstoke Reach. Um, the second thing is, is that the biggest problem identified in the Revelstoke Reach isn't actually the seasonal flows, it's the uh, peaking out of the reservoir. And uh, that's something that's a, a serious issue. And there's we've had some discussions about things that might be done in terms of changing the way we manage the Revelstoke Reservoir itself to try and diminish peaking, but those are things that are literally just in the discussion stage at the moment. And another question, uh, Brooke? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, uh, there are lots of questions coming in, so thanks everybody, and if we don't have time to answer them verbally, we'll do our best to answer them online. How do you think the flow regime that you're suggesting will affect the ability to grow food in riparian areas that currently get flooded for short periods of the year? The area south of Revelstoke lost hundreds of farms with the creation of the Arrow Lakes. Can we get some back? So part of the flow regimes, and this is maybe more related to the floodplain riparian wetland study that um, uh, Greg and Stu are leading, is looking at how we might manage the reservoirs at, at say like a lower pool as an example. Um, so in that case, if you were to manage the reservoirs um, at a lower full pool, you could probably, you would restore some of that habitat. 
Um, downstream, some of the ideas that we've been looking at is trying to restore the upper ends of the hydrograph so that we can help promote some of the sediment movement through the system. So in that case, we'd likely have, you know, um, yeah, higher flows potentially in some of those downstream areas during certain times of the year to help promote some of those uh, riparian and riverine functions. So yeah, I think there could be some uh, food uh, opportunities. I'll just add a quick answer to that. The, uh, there are some socioeconomic performance measures. We're not discussing those tonight. And one of those, one of those performance measures is looking at the potential for restoring uh, farmland in the upper Aero Reservoir. If you look at the uh, mid Aero study that was published a couple of years ago, that there's some estimates on potential area that could be gained under that particular scenario as well. Thanks very much, you two. Uh, Bill, go ahead. We've got about another six or seven minutes for questions, so so how about her? Okay, well, I'm going to uh, do the question that it perhaps might best be answered by our subsequent panelists, like Richard Pisanich or Wendell Challenger. And the question is, what is the outlook for salmon rehabilitation? And Richard, I imagine you could go on, or Richard or Wendell could go on that for a long time, but can you give us a short and pithy answer? Yeah, the short high level is, um, good evening folks. Why, uh, Rich Basanich here calling in from the Silks Okanagan territory. Um, we, if you look at a landscape level bill, we know that well over 50% of available habitat is upstream of the current dams and extended range of salmon, um, especially within, you know, within the Canadian portion. Um, from a historical percent, uh, percentage or abundance, uh, what does that translate to? Well, within the context of the last hundred plus years, you know, we're talking about uh, if you could break up just for sockeye per se um, across the entire Columbia, and you have a hundred sockeye spread out amongst eighteen key areas in the Columbia Basin, the Okanagan and Arrow system produced probably anywhere between. 30 and 50, um, 50 of those 100 sockeye. It was a very dominant fish producer um, historically. And, and, uh, and this also um, can speak to Chinook as well as Steelhead um, within this area. So I'm not sure if Wendell has anything to add, but this was a dominant area. It's a high producing area, uh, cold water refugia and um, it offers hope in terms of uh, uh, sustaining and persisting salmon runs in the Columbia. Thanks. Thanks so much, Richard. And we'll hear more on that, more from you and on that a little bit later after the break. Bill, do we have another question? Sure. Uh, this one is the Kukanusa Reservoir will not have any vegetation if there is no water for the growth. Uh, what is planned for that? And I think that uh, maybe Greg and Stuart and even Ryan could provide an answer to that. Who, so who's first up? I could, I could start with that. And um, Kukanusa is, uh, has a, a somewhat different cluster of challenges than um, the other uh, the Canadian reservoirs, although the southern end of Arrow has some commonalities. And the key reason for the difference is that it has much warmer, drier summer. And so there's a change in the ecoregion. It's Ponderosa pine and grassland, it's Doug Fir, a much drier, um, warmer summers. Um, and so drought becomes a more prominent limitation as opposed to flood, which is a prominent limitation uh, up in the Valemont area of Kinbasket. And so uh, relative to this, we've to some extent focused on, on the flooding regime and inundation tolerance. Um, relative to uh, Kukanusa, um, the prospect of drought tolerance becomes more important. Um, I might say that um, the current situation relative to um, Kukanusa uh, does involve some very promising zones relative to riparian vegetation, especially at the delta of the Elk River, but also the Sand Creek and Gold Creek. Um, and relative to um, those and also the Kootenai Delta, there's a fair amount of livestock grazing. And so it's possible that some coordination of livestock grazing might actually complement the revegetation or re uh, 
um, greening of some of these zones at Kukanusa. Thanks very much, Stuart. Bill, we've got time for, I think, a couple more questions. Okay. I think this one I'm throwing right at Brian. I hope he's ready. Why are most numbers from more than 20 years ago? The change climate changes everything. That's a really good question. Um, so the data sets that we're actually using in the modeling and um, in most of this work right now are actually uh, derived by EPA. So what, they're, what they do is they essentially rebuild the naturalized hydrographs. So those are actually used as inputs into the modeling that we're doing. There are updated data sets that go to 2018 um, that we're looking at uh, updating our, our modeling to. Um, so that's one of the main reasons um, that we're looking at the, the, those older data sets is they, they're kind of a standard set of uh, inflows that we're using for the modeling. So they go from 1928 to 2008, and we're looking at updating potentially to a, a more recent time series. I might just add to that, uh, since the uh, question also talked about climate change, is that we will be running a, uh, a, a projected climate uh, hydrograph into the future based on climate change models as well. And so it, we're not ignoring the fact that the climate is changing by any means. This next question is from uh, a golden kin basket guy. The mica hydrograph peak is months later than the model and reaches uh, the peak when planting might want lower levels. How is it proposed to release this much water to obtain planting levees? And I think perhaps either Greg or Stewart can start by answering the question of, uh, you no, know, uh, it's not really a planting levees approach, but uh, and what levels might be you might be hoping could be restored through lower water levels. Thanks. I, I could comment a little bit. Um, so yes, uh, the, the, the north, north end of Kin Basket um, uh, does indeed have a, a different natural seasonality. So if you look at the hydrograph of the Canoe River, which is that northern inflow, um, it's, it's much different than, for example, the Elk or the Kootenai. Um, and I think it's likely that the, the native vegetation are also somewhat adapted to that different timing. So one element of the field studies that we um, have been working on now for a few years is phenology, which is the categorizing the timing of the biological processes. Um, and we certainly need to pay attention to that. And it also means that um, there won't be a one size fits all solution. And so as the scenarios um, yield some promising opportunities, we'll need to make sure that for those particular cases, we do have correspondence in timing relative to the patterns of rise and recession. I could just add to that. I, we didn't have time to go into great detail, but as I showed that one slide of different differences in the growing season between different parts of the, the uh, mica reservoir, um, we also are looking at that in terms of fine tuning our projections in terms of plant, um, plant encouraging uh, vegetation around the edges of the reservoir. Um, so yeah, definitely we need to take into account that seasonality is quite different in different reservoirs and even in different parts of some reservoirs. Um, I would also say that, you know, we're not worried so much about the flow rates as we're talking about the upper, you know, one to 10 meters in the reservoir itself, we're not actually talking about necessarily working along the rivers, we're talking about within the reservoir boundaries, and it's only the upper fringes that we're talking about. So it's keeping them from being flooded no matter what the season. Thanks very much, uh, Greg and Stuart, uh, and, and also to Ryan. I think we're going to break now. Um, so, so really, I thank you to Ryan for your presentation and Bill for fielding these questions. Um, we're going to take about a five minute break. And when we come back, we're going to hear our last presentation of the night on operations to assist in restoring anadromous salmon.
and we'll have you know time to answer questions on on salmon reintroduction and we'll also have time at the end to circle back to some of the questions uh, you guys have posed that haven't been answered yet so uh, stay tuned uh, take a minute to go you know grab a glass of water or something stretch your legs and we'll be back in five minutes very pleased to introduce the next presentation um, and our next presenters. So Richard Brusanich, who you've already met from the Okanagan Nation Alliance and Wendell Challenger from LGL Limited are both going to talk about uh, operations for restoring an adromous salmon. So Richard, I'll, I'll pass it over to you, carry on. Yeah, good evening folks, why? Um, it's a privilege and an honor to be um, speaking to this subject with a great team of folks that helped put this together. Uh, Bill started a, us off speaking to what was labeled anadromous species. Uh, we're not going to be talking about transmigratory sturgeon that may, historically could have made their way to the Pacific, we're not talking about Pacific lamprey. We're not going to be speaking on the seven species of anadromous salmon that historically made their way to the, uh, the, the upper Canada portions. Uh, we'll be speaking um, later on, Wendell will be drilling down specifically into um, a program and, and, a, um, and an example of Okanagan sockeye specifically to this subject. And really, hopefully the, the first half here, my introduction is just established, relaying and establishing our relationship with salmon. So um, yeah, next Wendell. So we're talking about, not only are we talking about an iconic creature, but uh, we're talking about a people, a salmon people, a salmon landscape. Um, to some, it's a metaphor of hope and survival. Um, it's a teacher, it's a spirit. Um, it can be a data point to scientists. These animals to a nutritionist, this, this we could measure it as 3,700 kilojoules per, per portion of fish or X number of omega fatty acids or DHAs for brain development. To a First Nations people, this, this, is, like, this, is, this is essence to life. And uh, the first, first half here, I just wanna speak to, um, to pause and for folks to just look at these images historically that speak to community, to speak to relationships, speak to the land and water, um, just speak to what was abundant and speak to the technologies and the innovations and the knowledge that's been translated thousands of years. Next. So there's, in addition to time immemorial memories and lessons and teachings and ceremonies, um, there's a, been a lot of active work, more, more active work since the 1970s forward, some key milestones, some key collaborations that have happened over the past 30 to 50 years. Um, in the, from about 2004, there was uh, the, the three tribe, the three First Nations, um, established a workshop back in 2004, just to engage the conversation Upper Columbia Salmon. In 2014, what you see here before you is an example of a joint paper that was presented on the concept and the feasibility and the idea of passing salmon back to their relic range and the importance of ceremony and, and that connection again. More recently, over the last five years, Adults and juveniles um, through the tribes in the US and, and the First Nations groups in Canada, that reconnection is living. Um, fish are, are being presented back to their natal waters and, uh, and reestablishing that connection. Next. You know, very proud of what is 
pretty much a, a similar canoe, a parallel canoe um, that's being integrated into CRT. And this is establishing what we call the big five, you know, BC and Canada and the three nations reconciling and finding truth and finding a way to get along. This motif, the language and the, and the words that are shared, speak to the salmon chiefs, speak to the story of uh, reconnecting. Next. These illustrations of unity, of finding a way together, are representations, they're art, creative stories that are shared from the three nations from left to right, Sockeye from left, Chinook in the center, and Chinook on the far right, from artists that shared from Sequepmik, Silks Okanagan, and Tanaha, specifically Kelsey Jewels, Spirit Peoples, and Darcy Luke. These represent relationships carrying forward the relationship. They're examples of messaging of Coyote and the Eagle Staff of calling back the salmon and the bear prints establishing the four food chiefs of nourishment. They symbol life and the regeneration of life and the hope. Next. There is just one slice of a vast area of hope. Just outlining two specific, what we call salmon planning units, watersheds, Salmon landscapes within from Hugh Kinley down to the border and within the Slocan watershed. This is just one snippet of data that outlines current potential habitat for spawners of Chinook just alone in these areas, if given the opportunity to learn from the fish and give them a chance to uh, tell us where they want to go. Next. So not only there's their hope for plenty of habitat to be re-nourished and reconnected with salmon, <clears throat> the studies that um, we're going to share, the information that's being shared is based on quite, uh, quite a good baseline. Um, like to give full accolades to Fisheries and Oceans and Dr. Kim Hyatt, Margot Stockwell and their team that have been working not only within our basin, but establishing what we call a baseline of multiple years, a, a, what, we, what some scientists would say is data rich. And not only does this include Okanagan sockeye, but since 2005, a similar baselines have been established for Chinook so that we can learn from this past information moving forward as well as all the good work that's been happening in the Columbia Basin within the Arrow and Kootenai system since the 90s onwards, a very data-rich environment and data-rich base for us to learn from moving forward. So while there's a lot of uncertainties, we have what most people would consider relatively good data moving forward. Next. And so Wendell will be taking us through a series of slides and uh, speaking to the following objectives where he's gonna share with you how we've broken out and trying to dissect across marine and freshwater um, stages of these fish, uh, the dynamics under various life stages from eggs through adults, and then how this inter integrates and relates to the management decisions for hydroregulation. And I, th I think just before Wendell gets into this, we, this is one of the things I reflect on. I remember Kim Hyatt talking about establishing cumulative models and why he thought salmon was such a, an amazing animal to represent a cumulative model of what happens, not only in thousands of kilometers of freshwater environment shared mutually between the US and Canada and this salmon landscape from headwaters to the estuary, but the thousands of kilometers, square kilometers of habitat in the marine environment and what we can learn in terms of that holistic and cumulative uh, perspective uh, that really has been at, I guess, the, uh, the challenge, the rub, if you will, between West, the Western lens and the indigenous lens of learning and knowledge systems and that connection and where we center ourselves. So 
I just wanted to um, say that as Wendell takes us through some uh, some of the data that's being worked up and examples moving forward. So Wendell, over to you. Thank you, folks. So <clears throat> the the ecosystem functioning that we're investigating uh, as part of the for the CRT work uh, comes from a much bigger modeling project that's being led by ONA, uh, and it's we want to simulate the salmon population dynamics all the way from freshwater through the marine and then back. And so that we can, assess, as Richard was referring to, accumulative impacts. So this, this bigger model that this work's pulled from is <clears throat> we're building a, a large scale model that will be integrating in all sorts of different type of management inputs from water management, which we're discussing here today, uh, fisheries, land, environment, and climate change predictions. And this feeds into different components uh, where we model each of the life history steps, and we basically integrate in all the research that's been going on for decades and decades now and trying to build this large cumulative effects model. This outputs metrics of interest uh, that we can then use to help advise. And if you're not familiar with anadromous salmon and their life cycle, there's, they're quite complex and there's all sorts of mechanisms and uh, of interest that we're working to include and that researchers have documented and worked on over over the last 20, 30 years, oh, 50, 60 years, really. So in terms of the CRT modeling, we wanted to look at how uh, impacts of flow regimes and flows affected migration of anadromous salmon through the, the Columbia Basin. And specifically, we want to understand the impacts on earlier and later timed fish because <clears throat> there's a distribution of fish that move through uh, over time. And we'd like to know whether or not certain flow regimes would be disproportionately impacting earlier or later migrants because they can be important uh, life history variation. And we also want to be able to derive sort of a, an integrated assessment uh, across all these uh, different timing groups. <clears throat> So what we're looking at is mainly the survival and movements as they leave Canada and move through the US and then how different uh, flow regimes and management um, decisions can impact the flows that they're gonna experience and therefore their, the success that they'll, they'll have in the Columbia system. Uh, we're, we're also looking eventually to under development also start to get at the timing of when they're leaving and returning to the basin um, and that's ongoing work and will be integrated in the near future. So the way we do this is we create, uh, we track what we call virtual cohorts. So we create uh, pretend bunches of fish that will go down through the system. Uh, and that's designed to represent the natural timing and abundances that historically we're seeing. Uh, we then look at what the daily flows are that they're encountering and we predict the survival of these fish these virtual fish as they move through the system. And from that, we derive our, our metrics of how we think a particular flow regime will do. So, you know, the structure of it, we, we take in, we have information about species. We're considering more than one species. Uh, we look at what the migration windows are, when the abundance are, are coming through to sort of generate these cohorts. And then we look at the management operations in the system and use regression models based on long-term studies of, uh, of survival and the flows that were encountered during those survivals to predict what these future virtual cohorts will survive. And we then combine them to understand how it impacts the early and late timed fish, how it impacts a run overall, how it impacts different species. So this all works from once we, you know, we, the models the, the flow models working on right now, they predict how the dams and the discharges may change under different regulations or different uh, management strategies. From that, we understand the flows and the timing, and we use that to predict how this is going to impact anadromous salmon, both in their travel times or transit times and, and subsequent survivals, and how it may impact and affect certain groups, uh, timing groups more than the other. For example, if we're shifting flows from later <coughs> into earlier in the season, we can understand how that could impact the certain portion of the migration window. And from that, we generate performance measures to help assess uh, whether or not a particular flow regime is a sensible one to, to do. And that sort of gives you a summary of this, just the start of our work. Uh, we're definitely 
delving in more and as time goes on and we further develop that large scale uh, integrated life cycle model, I think more components can be integrated into this modeling work as well. Thank you. Thank you both very much. Uh, that was great. And I know that we've got some questions uh, and we also have somebody who's raised their hand. So uh, Bill, I'll pass it over to you to read out one of our typed in questions and then maybe we'll go over and uh, answer a raised hand here. Thanks. And yet there are a few, uh, there's quite a few questions still, many unanswered, some answered. Um, but I'm going to turn my attention to those questions, turn our attention to those questions uh, responding to this recent presentation about salmon. So I'll start. If time permits, we can get back to some of the other questions. When can we expect the salmon chiefs back in the Arrow Reservoir? It's the right thing to do, especially under the UN declaration. Um, yeah, I um, can't speak for each nation, um, but uh, we are, we do know that Mark Thomas recently was named the salmon chief for the Shushwap. Um, there were ceremonial releases this past year up in the headwaters, and we are aware that his community endorsed that, and each community um, obviously um, has their ways of doing that uh, through ceremony, etc. And so um, can't speak specifically to arrows, but um, uh, I will make we can make that comment and it's active, it's alive and um, the nations, um, yeah, the nations will continue to uh, build out uh, bottom up from their members and and so forth. Thank you for the, uh, the thank you for the question. Thanks very much, Richard and Bill. Uh, I'm I'm going to move over to somebody who has raised their hand. Uh, Buzz, I'm going to allow you to talk. You'll need to unmute yourself, and then go ahead and ask your question. We'll give it a minute here. Okay, there might be some technical difficulties there. So Bill, I'm gonna pass it back over to you and we'll we'll come back to Buzz in a bit if, if he'd still like to ask a question. Go ahead, okay. Bill. Another salmon oriented question. I've heard concern that the salmon being reintroduced into the Columbia and Kootenai rivers come from polluted waters and are therefore toxic. Is there any truth to this? Um, well, if we're talking anadromous salmon, um, the, the couple of case studies, uh, this came to light under the Fukujiwa Japanese nuclear meltdown that happened years ago. ONA, as well as several of the Columbia lower tribes uh, did sample fish that were making their way from that, uh, that would have been exposed to that event over a two year period. And DFO also, uh, we were aware that DFO also conducted some studies and some of the Northeast Pacific agencies and the ones that came back to at least Canada and mid Columbia, um, there were there were non detectable levels of those fish uh, that had entered the river from those sampled, and so it just begged the question that perhaps those fish never made it back um, to the mouth of the Columbia, or just um, you know didn't make their way to some of the terminal areas. That's one example. Um, that doesn't certainly speak, and so as adults going through, they only spend such a very minute period of time that, um, you know, I know there's some of the responses from various experts have said that um, continued sampling of those fish over time has repeatedly shown non-detectable levels. That's not to say that there isn't a concern, and so I know that the three nations, there's a whole group working on this very question of risk assessment under the Tanaha and they, their group um, looking at the topic of risk analysis. These, this is one of the things that have come up through that exercise and will be taking, a, that group will be taking a, a closer look, a more detailed look at these questions and formulating um, some of the studies that might follow so hopefully that answers that question. It's a good question. Thanks, Richard. Bill, what's next? Okay, 
no more seven questions right now. So I'm going to go back one and lob it. I hope Greg is ready. Uh, it's actually formulated by a colleague and I think it's custom made for Greg. So here goes. Under the best case scenario of these proposals, and assuming that say 80 to 90% of present hydropower and flood risk management continues to be achieved, can you give us a very rough estimate of the percentage habitat recovery that may be possible across all these reservoirs? Just a ballpark to better understand the extent of what will still be lost. Thank you. Greg, are you able to take that one on as a start? It's a big, a big question. Um, I can't give an exact number. I would have to go and have a look, but we've recently been doing some calculations to look at number of hectares of area that may be revegetated, assuming we got one meter, two meters, three meters, up to 10 meters below full pool in the various reservoirs. Um, I, I can't really say what the potential outcome is. Um, the total amount will depend on the outcome of the uh, treaty negotiations and the outcome of the treaty negotiations are unknown. But, you know, realistically, assuming that uh, hydropower and flood control are still major concerns and both sides of the border, um, the likelihood is, you know, of achieving 10% uh, of, of any given reservoir would probably be a very large gain um, because Basically, every meter that you don't fill reduces flood storage and has some impact on power production. Um, so there's lots of trade-offs to be made, but I would say it's probably in that less than 10% sort of realm. Ready for another one, Brooke? Go ahead. Okay. Uh, I think this one's tossing coming right at Ryan. And has there been much thought about the downstream fluctuation impacts on habitat? And I'll give a quick start to that, which is the work that Ryan reported on about functional flows is about exactly that question, but I think uh, Ryan can provide a much more fulsome answer. Yeah, thanks, Bill. Um, <clears throat> yeah, that, that's exactly what we are looking at. So we're looking at uh, specifically what types of habitats can we reestablish for um, key species? And that's the approach that we're taking uh, in this work is, is using those key species as surrogates or analogs for ecosystem function. Um, there's been a bunch of work done on evaluating, you know, what types of habitats have uh, potentially been lost and how they've been altered. Um, there's been a bunch of work done on sturgeon. Um, and yeah, so there, there are numerous studies and um, a lot of them are actually available uh, in the public domain online. So um, I'd encourage you to, to check those out. Okay, we do, we do have a couple of more salmon questions. Thanks, folks. And um, they're pretty linked, so I'm going to read both of them out, and hopefully Richard and or Wendell will take a stab at them. So if salmon are introduced, this is the first question, into, say, the Arrow Lakes region, how do they get back over the dams to the ocean to complete their cycles? If they are trapped in the region, are they facing predator fish? And then a related question. I'm not clear how juvenile salmon make it back to the ocean. Do dam intakes exclude the juveniles? Um, well, I'll start off and then Wendell can add items. So the first one was the Arrow Lakes. Um, so these fish, can, can you repeat them in succinctly again, Bill, real quick? What was the first one again? Sure, you can also see them in the Q&A, but here, the first one was, if salmon are introduced into, say, the Arrow Lakes region. Oh, I see it here. Sorry. Uh, how, they get okay. back over the, how do they get back over the dams? Okay, so yes, currently, um, so in the, there's been a lot of studies um, and a lot of examples uh, through the mid-Columbia and lower Columbia, where there's um, actual passage, the experimental passage, and then standard passage techniques that have been used largely for salmon and new developments for non-salmon species over the last 50 plus years. And so learning lessons from um, the U.S. Army Corps and folks to the south, as well as um, some key studies here in Canada, we'll be looking that we will, that'll be one of the first things, one of the key threats that we'll be working with uh, 
um, the, you know, the big five, but also with the um, utility hydro operators on establishing juvenile passage, bypass passage, uh, collection of fish, um, moving them through a variety of techniques, whether it's by barge or truck or through structures through the dams, over the dams, uh, and similar with adults, uh, vice versa coming back. And so there are various technologies um, that are being explored with these high head dams, uh, largely out of the US and uh, lessons to be learned. Um, yeah, so that's hopefully that speaks to that one. If they're trapped in a region facing predator fish, um, yeah, that's a complicated one. I've been in meetings where people, we, we pointy-headed scientists try and dumb it down for ourselves to say everything eats everything. So um, yeah, there's quite the um, uh, composition of fish eating a variety of fish, top apex fish, uh, that'll definitely, you know, from a sockeye uh, perspective will benefit. Um, in the Skaha program here, uh, if you talk to locals, some of the, there were some key concerns about sockeye and kokanee competing, many studies over many years, and can definitely tell you that um, a lot of fishers here in the Okanagan are very pleased in terms of the quality of fishing that's going on with rainbow trout. So um, not saying that each lake is a replicate of other situations, but that is a good news story. So um, it's complex, um, but there are, there are some definite benefits um, uh, via, uh, say, sockeye to rainbow trout and other species there in arrows. Uh, making it back to the ocean, do dams intakes exclude the juveniles? Um, no, some of the dams in the US, so um, there are specific dams in the US where the turbines, the, the testing of fish passage through the turbines as opposed to spillways or other routes via the, um, the structure itself is shown to be um, a better course uh, for these fish to go at, at, at specific sizes by species and by time of flows. And so um, this is an interesting question because each project site is very unique. And these are one of the complex things that we as a modeling group uh, will definitely be challenged with moving forward. But um, we're confident that, that the scale and the type of question that we're asking um, we'll still be able to answer questions, but this one here, dam intakes, um, sometimes in some situations, um, it's better for the fish to go through the turbines, believe it or not. Um, it's, in other situations, it's not good for fish to go through the bypass st structures because of descaling to the fish. And so it's complicated, but there's been a, a tremendous amount of work through, again, the US Army Corps, uh, dealing with these very questions. And uh, Wendell, I don't know, I know that you and your team have looked at these specific questions. Would you like to add or clarify anything to that? I was, I was just going to uh, add that <clears throat> it depends which part of the Columbia River you're speaking of. Um, there is different amounts of studies that have gone into uh, fish passage through it and, and success rates by, path, by pathway. Uh, especially in the lower Columbia and in Snake River that's been studied quite thoroughly, less so in the mid and upper uh, reaches of the Columbia River where we have um, just more uh, uh, baseline survival estimates, uh, but not by pathway. We can tell you approximately how many juveniles will make it through the system. It's about 30, 40, 50 percent, somewhere around in there uh, from around the basin through to uh, close to the ocean. So you have to realize that <clears throat> there's about a million or so smolts leaving uh, and that there's a lot of mortality. It's a, it's these, the reproductive strategy for salmon is to produce lots of small babies that unfortunately do not do well. So you often see high mortality rates even in, in natural conditions. So but what we're trying to do is actually quantify that and understand all the factors, for example, temperature, flow, et cetera, that can predict whether or not you're gonna have higher or lower amounts. And all those type of modeling we're also using when we're looking at reintroducing species. So, you know, your, your, all the questions were correct. There's a lot of challenges they face. And when we're considering reintroduction, we try to put numbers to that and see how variable those could be and therefore how successful a reintroduction could be or how much effort we'd need to introduce to offset against all those sources of mortality. So yeah, there's a lot of ongoing research, a lot of work to make sure that we can understand where we lose fish 
and, and the ranges. Go ahead, Richard. Yeah, just to that, I think this is a, a great opportunity to demonstrate the power of ceremony. Um, so adult fish from the Yukat tribes, adult Chinook and sub-adults have been released um, within the um, within their portion of upstream of Grand Coulee and Chief Joe. And we know that over the last few years, adults have made it up into Canada. And we've recently learned that adults are actually being caught, sub-adults are being caught in Arrow Lakes. And this is something we had no idea about over the last few years. But recent reports from anglers, not just in the transboundary, but out of Edgewood and so forth, have been reporting catches. And so it really activated us and the group that's working to that together, the, the three nations, as well as the agencies to start asking, you know, begging the question, well, obviously fish made it through, adults made it through the locks. As, um, as incredible as that sounds, um, these are the things where fish will tell us what they're gonna do. And so lots to be learned, definitely. The presentation today focuses mostly on the downstream aspects, but knowing that we're, we're, you know, there's definitely gonna be a horsepower put to this to start uh, using this model for the upper Columbia and stressing salmon recovery opportunities um, there, as well as the juvenile releases that Okanagan have been providing and more recently, uh, the shoe swap in the headwaters opportunity to learn from fish that have been released over a two, three year period, um, even though these are small numbers of a thousand to 5,000 fish that have been ceremonially released um, at Castlegar, Revelstoke, and more recently at Slocan. Uh, we have yet, we've pit tagged these fish so that there's an opportunity to learn. And what we've learned over these last few years um, is that small numbers, we anticipated low, low numbers. Um, currently, over the last three years from the various releases, we're seeing about anywhere between one and 3% survival through Grand Coulee, through Chief Joe, down through Rocky Reach. And so um, there's always hope. Um, these fish are amazing, they find a way. And so yes, really low numbers as to be expected, but what we, um, you know, what we haven't, what we didn't expect to date was um, uh, just what the fish have taught us is that there's a group of fish that move out right away. There's a group of fish that hang out for a year and then go out at a different time of the year. So the ones that we release ceremonies in June, um, typically the, the sub year, what we call subs, that year release go out in August. And in um, the following year, there's a group of sockeye that go out in April, a whole month before our Okanagan stock go out, as well as this year, a follow-up year, Two years later, after hanging out in Lake Roosevelt, a portion of fish that are making their way out to sea two years later, and this is coming from a stock that typically predominantly only stages one year. And so it's exciting. It's um, in terms of the, you know, being a biologist, a recovery biologist, this we're on the cutting edge of, you know, a new frontier and very proud to share these types of things and learn. And so the light, hopefully this kind of translates a little bit in terms of what Wendell shared, why we're looking at different life histories, trying to encompass the freshwater and marine, uh, knowing that, you know, what is, what was, and what could be, um, these, are, these are some really interesting unknowns and really learning from the fish. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, for that. Um, yeah. It, it's important to remember uh, all of the studies that can be done, really, the fish will do what they're going to do, and they'll show us the way. Um, Stuart, you've got your hand up. Uh, before you, you jump in, I do want to note that it's two minutes to the hour, uh, and, I, and I think that there is some interest or maybe some interest from the panelists to stay a little bit longer and answer some of these questions. Uh, but just noting that we've got two more minutes, Stuart, maybe you can say a few words and then um, I'll, I'll share a few closing comments before transitioning to answering questions after the fact. Stuart, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Brooke. I wanted to um, cycle back to uh, 
a question that I thought was really a tough one. That was Martin's question about what might be the perspective um, expansion. And I thought uh, it was noble for Greg to, to give it a, a go. And he's the person really who's most familiar with this. I might say that the value, if we go from vegetation to habitat, value is not a linear function. It's proportional to scarcity. If you have a million cottonwood trees and you add another thousand, there's really no big deal. If you have very few cottonwood trees and you add a thousand, you have a thousand potential roosting trees for eagles or osprey and, and cavity nesters and the list goes on. And so um, we will indeed think about areas of uh, habitat, but when you go from vegetation to wildlife, it turns out that I think that there may be some amplification that we need to pay attention to. And that's kind of a, a promising element. Thanks very much for that reminder, Stuart. Uh, so at, at this point, um, we're almost at the hour and I want to extend uh, my deep gratitude to all of the presenters tonight for putting together presentations that explain such complex information uh, in a way that, that can generate discussion. So thank you all. Uh, and thank you to everyone who's joined tonight. So there's still you know, just over 90 of you who are still listening in and we always appreciate your time uh, and your ability to listen. And please, again, encourage folks to watch the recording when it's available. Um, and if you have questions that come to you after you leave here tonight, please feel free to send them to us. Uh, we're going to put a, a slide up in a moment that has our email address as well as the website where you'll be able to find all of this information from tonight, um, as well as a link to the survey that we really, really would love for you to fill out. So when you close the meeting tonight, there'll be a little pop-up window that asks for your feedback. It'll link you to the survey. Uh, you can either answer it then, or we'll be also emailing it out to everybody in a day or two. Uh, and you can, you can fill it out more than once. So if you don't want to finish all the questions in one sitting, just submit what you can, and then you can come back later and, and submit the rest of your questions. Uh, it's not a long survey, but it just depends on how much uh, time and energy you want to put into the comments. So any and all feedback is welcome. Um, let, let me just double check and make sure I've covered everything here. I, I do want to invite the presenters to turn on their camera one more time uh, and, and give a little wave and maybe a, a silent applause from the audience here. Uh, this has been a really great session. And for those of you following along with these, these types of sessions or even our public meetings, uh, you know, we've often received comments about presentations on the ecosystem function work that people would like more detail uh, and, and certainly really difficult to do that in a short amount of time when we're covering the CRT negotiations. So this year, there was a great suggestion to hold a separate session specifically on this important work. And I'm really, really impressed with, with how it went and uh, by the fact that everybody's still online, that shows that you were as well. So thank you all once again. Um, stay in touch. And I think we'll, we'll stay on a little bit longer here uh, we'll leave the meeting open if people want to review the Q&As, uh, but we will end the recording now. And of course, folks who want to sign off can sign off. But with that, a really great thank you to everybody involved and, and a good night to those who need to say good night. <laughs>